Hi everyone, I'm Eleanor Mayer and I've been working as a lexicographer on the OED for 16 years and now I'm going to talk about the revision process, i.e. revising words that are already in the dictionary. So rather than going through the dictionary in alphabetical order when revising it, we prioritise entries where revision bring the greatest benefit to users. And so when we decide what words to revise, um, we categorise them into three streams. So there are foundation words, and these are key words in the language, semantically productive, culturally adaptive, as you can see on the slide. So these are large complex words which have exhibited a lot of change over, over time and which are used in a large number of semantic contexts. For example, coach, block, dock, staff, and you can see some of those in blue on the slide as well. And then we also have function words, things like if, for, who, and there are a finite number of these, but um, this is where as expert editors, we can add a lot of value for users by um, tracing the history of these um, complex, very useful words. And we have an editor with particular expertise in that area who works on the function words. And then the third category is priority words. And these are entries that are identified as most in need of urgent revision or expansion, but they might not necessarily be long or complex words like fast or right. Um, examples of these priority words are coquette, which um, we've recently revised because the formal definition sounded very dated and a bit sexist as well. Um, heathen, which um, the new entry will be published soon because again, that seemed rather Christian centric. Um, quite insensitive to people not belonging to Abrahamic religions as it was defined. So it was a chance to look at that again and define it in a more up-to-date and neutral way. Or a word like Czech, where um, the entry was originally written before the splitting of Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. So we needed to update that entry to reflect um, the current as well as the past um, history of how that word is used. And we might identify these priority candidates because of a story in the news, um, feedback from users. Um, if users are writing to us about the definition of heathen um, and its Christian centricness, um, we might do targeted searches as well. So we might look for particular words and definition, which um, will alert us to the fact that the definition might be out of date or jarring or insensitive. Um, for example, we might um, search for the word um, trollop in definitions just to see whether um, and that might alert us to words to do with women that could be defined in a better way. And as well as revising whole entries, we also sometimes just decide to revise a particular sense within an entry. So the entry as a whole might not be in urgent need of revision, but one sense might seem particularly dated or incomplete. And then we will just prioritise that sense for revision again, so we can bring the most value to users um, and use our time where it will be most valuable. So recent examples of partial revision include the word devolution in the UK politics sense, um, inflation in the financial sense, and um, the sexual sense of the word grope. And on the slide, you can see an example of what the entry looked like before we, what the, this particular sense looked like before we revised it. The other senses of grope looked fine, but this one um, d definitely needed updating not least because there was no definition, it just said in an indecent sense, but also because um, the editors have said it was obsolete and it, it's not obsolete. So we brought up the evidence to the present day. And we will also employ partial revision if we're focusing our efforts on a particular variety of English. For example, a few years ago, we updated and drafted a number of entries and words and sentences do a Caribbean, from the Caribbean in the Caribbean variety of English. And we also revised some Caribbean senses, which were part of a larger entry. So, for example, this um, sense of snowball refers to shaved or chipped ice flavoured with syrup. And as well as being used in um, the US, it's also um, particularly used in the Caribbean and Bermuda. So, um, so although we left the rest of the entry for snowball alone, we decided to revise this particular sense um, to accompany all the other Caribbean words we'd revised or drafted. So when we revise, so this is, I've just described how we choose entries for revision, but how do we actually go about revising an, an entry? What kind of things do we need to think about? 
So on this slide, there's um, just some of the very many questions we ask when revising an entry. So firstly, um, we look at the entry and we think, is there a logical development of sensors within the entry? Will a user be able to navigate their way through it? And if it's not logical, do we need to think about the structure, how we can signpost it more clearly for users? Um, we might think, do any sensors need splitting? Um, the original editors of the OED were working on paper and, um, and every letter was literally money for them. Um, every single word was, um, was more cost for the publisher. So they would try to squeeze as much together as they could. And that sometimes results in very dense sensors, which now we're online, we, can, we have the freedom to split them and really show the strands of meaning um, there. And as um, I talked about earlier, we look at, are there any missing sensors which need to be drafted? For example, a, a block or blocker. And then when it comes to definitions, we think, will a user be able to understand the definition? And will they be able to tell from the definition why this sense is um, distinct from another sense? And part of our work as revisers is modernizing um, the original definitions. So they're written in clear, modern and elegant English. And we have to be careful not to not to keep archaic sounding language from the first edition or making things more complex than they need to be. And we have to ask ourselves, does the definition exhibit unconscious bias or a particular viewpoint? Um, for example, with heathen, are we writing the definition from a Christian viewpoint? Um, we have to make sure that the definition adequately covers all the quotations. Are there any things in the quotation paragraph which aren't covered by the definition? Um, but likewise, we have to make sure that the definition hasn't been skewed just to fit one outline quotation, which actually would be better off not including. Um, we have to make sure that any quotations we use um, to illustrate the sense are actually examples of that sense. And we have to make sure that the quotations represent typical usage of the word and that we include examples from a variety of Englishes and sources. Sometimes an entry might require a label, like, for example, a regional label. Is it only ever used in the north of England or in Indian English? And I'll show an example of that later. Or do we need another label? Do we need to say that the word is colloquial? Is it offensive? Is it now archaic? Um, do we need to upgrade um, any of the compounds or derivatives? And this means do we need to take any items that are nested in the entry and make them their own headword with their own etymology and pronunciation? And have we shown how this sense or entry is related to other entries in the dictionary so users can use that one entry as a jumping off point to explore um, the word and how it relates to other words and concepts in the language? And finally, um, most sensors in the OED are linked to the historical thesaurus of the OED. And as editors, when we're revising, we have to make sure that that, that linking is still correct, even if we've split entries or rewritten the definition. So now I'll show a few entries of before and after sensors to illustrate just a few aspects of revision, and in particular, how corpus evidence has influenced editing decisions. So this is the entry for coach. Um, well, not the entry, just one sense of coach. And this, um, this entry was first written in 1891 and we decided to revise it as it, we identified it as a foundation word. So it's used in a variety of contexts. Um, it's been around for a long time, creates a lot of compounds, um, quite frequent in the language. So this sense from 1891 refers to a private tutor who prepares a candidate for an examination. And then it says in transferred use, I, as an extension of that, someone who trains another in, a, in an athletic context especially in a boat race. And when we were looking at the evidence um, from the various corpora, we saw that in the 20th century, as you might guess, um, this word has seen a lot of development, especially in this particular sense to do with coaching in both in sports and in business. And I'll just show here. Um, so this is this one sense. This is what it looks like after revision. And what was just two senses has expanded into um, about seven senses, I think. Um, and, it, and this is all within the 20th century, really, 
showing all the ways the word coach has developed. And this type of um, expansion isn't, isn't uncommon. Usually entries expand by about 20% during revision. And here we have the corpus evidence for coach. And what I've showed here is um, the collocations for coach from three corpora from three separate time periods. So the first corpus is our early English books online corpus, which um, is a corpus of evidence from between around 1470 to 1700. And you can see here that the typical collocates of coach are things like hackney coach, gilded coach, morning coach, velvet coach. These are hired coach. So we're talking about the mode of transport here. And then the middle example is from the Bodleian Google Books corpus. And that's from around 1800 to 1940. And again, we're still talking about hackney coaches, stage coaches, mail coaches, morning coaches, four horse coaches. So still very much um, the mode of transport. But then when we look at um, a corpus of um, contemporary English from around 2000 to 2012, the picture is very different. Here we have head coaches, assistant coaches, football coaches, um, pitching coach, the England coach. Um, so we can see here that um, the meaning has like shifted quite dramatically from major transport, which still is a strand of meaning, to um, a person who provides coaching, especially for sports. And this corpus evidence, um, we can use this to decide how to split um, that one sense of coach in the, original, the first edition of the dictionary into the current version, which you will be able to see on the website shortly. And my next example is the adjective deep-seated. And this slide um, shows the entry before revision. And it has two senses, um, perhaps not particularly informative. The first sense is having its seat far beneath the surface. Um, and the second sense just says figurative. So the first sense refers to physical things that are deep-seated, such as an abscess, rocks. And um, the second sense is um, more abstract things, such as um, causes or faith in these examples. So one of the first things an editor would do in revising century is look at the corpora. And here are just um, two of those corpora. And the first one is the 19th century corpus. And when we look at the things um, that tend to be deep seated, it's things like abscess, separation, um, carriers, which means decay, um, ulcers, pains, tumours. So we exist very much in medical sense. And the things that are deep seated are things in the body, usually things that have gone wrong in the body. And that's, we see that an example of the deep seated ab abscess in the original entry. But, but the original entry didn't really make clear that that's the main way it's used, even though you can find examples in other contexts. And then when we look at the contemporary corpus, um, the picture is quite different. It's things like distrust, resentment, insecurity, prejudice, fear. So this is like feelings, um, opinions that can be deep seated in a person. And we can use this evidence um, to guide our revision of the entry. And so this is um, a slide of the revised entry. It's a draft. Um, we haven't quite finalized it, but it'll be published fairly soon. And the revised entry uses this evidence from the corpora to be much clearer about what kind of things are deep seated. So the, in fact, the earliest sense is of emotions, opinions, and then sense two says, especially of infections, ailments um, existing beneath the surface. And we still have the example of the deep seated molten rocks, but we've um, made it clear in the revision that this isn't typical. Typically it's infections, inflammations, things like that. And we can also use um, corpus evidence to kind of tease out some of the connotations of a word. So we don't want to define a word in a very neutral way or, or imply that it's used very neutrally when the word itself isn't neutral. So here we have um, the current definition for spinster. And um, it says a woman who's still unmarried, especially one beyond the usual age for marriage, an old maid. And apart from the word old maid, we haven't really 
you can imagine this is quite a neutral word and you could describe someone as a spinster or maybe not cause offence. But when you look at the um, modern corporate examples for spinster and what it's collocated with, it's things like dried up, childless, lonely, repressed, think frustrated, um, things like that. So um, this is an entry that's currently in revision and the revised entry will will show how, will explain some of the stereotypical associations that now come with being a spinster. And that also explains um, another sense of spinster, which um, is used in legal contexts as a title for a woman to show she's unmarried. And in um, the UK, it was added to marriage certificates for women um, to show they hadn't been married before. And for men, it was bachelor. But in the UK, this was abandoned a few years ago for the word single, um, probably because of the next, these really negative connotations for spinster. And um, if you're interested, you can look at bachelor in the corpus as well. And um, yeah, single men are, um, the connotations aren't as bad for single men as they are for single women. And you can do that by comparing spinster and bachelor in the corpora. And finally, we can use corpora to help us identify the regional distributions of a word or sense. Um, in, so for example, in 2020, we drafted a number of words which have come to prominence as a result of the global pandemic. And these included COVID, self-isolate and frontliner. And you might not be familiar with the word frontliner, but it's used to describe a person who works at the forefront of an organization's public activity but also especially someone who provides a, service, a, a vital service in the community, such as a healthcare worker or teacher. And in the UK, I think we would use the word key worker instead. And this was something um, just as key workers became prominent in the UK during the pandemic for the essential work they did to, to keep everything going. Um, Frontliner was used in a similar way, but in um, particularly in Southeast Asia. And, Below, you can just see the frequency of the word frontliner in various countries. And it's particularly prominent in the Philippines, Malaysia, and Singapore. And so when we were drafting the entry for frontliner, we reflected this corpus evidence about region in the definition note, now chiefly Southeast Asian. And um, if you're interested in finding out more about that um, update we did, for COVID related words. There's a number of blog posts about it, which, and I can circulate the links later for that. So I've been talking about some of the ways we use corpora when revising. And as well as corpora, we also use online databases as a source of evidence. And these are incredibly valuable. And this slide just shows a few of the online databases we use. And in the past, the original editors would have to when they wanted to find evidence of the word in use, they'd have to use words that come across by chance or that they guessed might be occurring in a particular work. Whereas now we can just go into one of these databases of newspapers or um, printed books, almost every printed books from the early modern period um, on eBay, early English books online, and we could just type in the word we're interested in or type in the word plus um, words that might be near to make sure we find the word in a particular sense we look for and it will just come up. And so this is like revolutionized the way we work really. And these online databases are of a number of different sources. So they can, a number of different types. So they can consist of um, transcribed texts like Ebo, which means it's um, really high quality, really valuable because um, the printed text has been manually typed in and checked or it can use optical character recognition where um, the books are scanned and then um, computationally converted into readable text or searchable text like Google Books. Or they can be a digital form to, to begin with, such as blog posts or Twitter. And these databases cover many different regions, such as America, India, Australia, different registers of English, colloquial slang, social media, or different subject areas such as science or law. And the historical databases such as Early English Books Online and 18th Century Collections Online are particularly valuable as the hard copies of many of the first editions 
are only accessible in libraries otherwise, whereas now we can just access them from our desk. And my next slide, I'll just show you the entry for shock. Um, and this is our in-house um, dictionary viewing software. And the bits in green just show the quotations we've added during revision and the sources. So you can see we've added it from Ebo, Early English Books Online, um, Google Books, um, Facts, which is an online newspaper database, I think it's newspapers.com, um, MPA, um, Newspaper Archive, an archive of American newspapers, and Google Books again. Um, but some entries can be from a really wide variety of sources. We can have Twitter, um, song, song lyrics, um, really specialist magazines, zines, um, everything really. 